part of it was the amount of time it takes for the blue to get from your mouth to your bum. Right. Basically. So um, I'm just going to need a little bit more information if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. You're listening to the tech podcast <laughs> off script. <laughs> Hashtag blue poop challenge. <laughs> Hello, you're listening to Offscript, and today we're going to be talking about imperfect innovation. Rio, Jack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Joshua. How are you? I'm great. Living the dream. Wonderful. Any? <laughs> that's, <quite, laughs> oh, that's quite sarcastic. No, 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 no. It's good to be here. Ah, oh, good. Well, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so you join us on a on a Friday. Um, it's been a long week. I'm absolutely knackered. Um, not getting any sleep for a newborn baby. The enthusiasm and verve that we will give to the next half an hour of debate will power you along. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your radio days are flooding back. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, it is th- why you're here, actually. Um, getting you back on to talk about innovation. Yes. Yes. Coming up with new things. I had such a good time chatting to you last time about, I forget the podcast topic. I think we did an AI one last time, didn't we? That was the one. Um, Multiverse. The the metaverse things, yeah. Multi- yeah. Metaverse. That aged well, it, didn't it? it? Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Zuckerberg. <laughs> Oh, don't worry though, because on the fourth of July he was seen um, skate. No, he was skiing, wasn't he? No, are you okay? Surf- Surfboarding. Surfing? Oh my god, I'm having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, you're not allowed to skateboard anymore. No, I'm not allowed to skateboard because I broke my collarbone. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry to bring that up again. Yeah. But, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's pretty stupid. But he was wakeboarding, I believe. Okay. Was it wakeboarding? I think it was wakeboarding. I don't know the difference in the formats of board. He was on water on what looked like a wakeboard um, with a fort with a with a American flag, wearing a, a suit and a beer. Yes, yeah. completely normal thing to do. But um, is Elon starting to mess with his head a bit? Yeah, I think it might be starting to kick in. Um, it's just, just niggling away. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so we're here to talk about innovation. <laughs> yes. Um, more, more importantly, imperfect innovation. So I, I thought this would be a good topic because um, innovation isn't perfect and, and often mistakes are made along the way and people are very quick to call out the mistakes. But I think what we don't talk about enough is the the sort of mistakes and the sort of constant iterations of failure lead to some really nice technology innovations. And yeah, I thought we could talk about how, how those leaps of innovation work and, and sort of how discovery of new things kind of work and just go through some public examples of things where they, they might not seem to work on, on the surface, but ultimately it's led to a, you know, a giant leap forward in technical advancements or something like that. And we have a few good examples of that uh, in history we can talk to, uh, big technology and company fails uh, and, and then kind of how they've kind of learned and evolved and, or died. Most of the time, just died actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but usually, what happens is someone picks up that innovation and, and kind of takes it forward. Or if you're Apple, just destroys loads of companies in the in the process. Yeah. So yeah, that's my summary of what I thought we'd talk about today. That's great. Thanks for listening to Off Script. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what do you think of this? So so we're quite quick to um, you know in the in the AI episode we talked a lot about. Um, about innovation and, and a lot about sort of their their process to to releasing new functionality. Quite a fearless approach from OpenAI. Not much care in the world for people's concerns around um, their implementation of AI. Not much really thought into the marketing of it. I, I'd say they're just kind of throwing a lot of stuff out there and seeing what works. Would be my summary. Is that something you agree with? Do you think that's their process? I think they want to get it out there and see what people do with it. Yeah, I think they have spent a lot of time thinking about safety, but not as much as some experts would have liked but Sam's argument for that is that they can't if they just develop it in a vacuum and then unleash it on the world that's going to be a lot worse and Mm. sort of dripping it out yeah just arguments for both definitely Um, I think the whole Google ethos of move fast and break things becomes a lot more of a high stakes game as things get more powerful mm. yeah. and we understand less about how those things actually work. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, move, move fast and break things with an algorithm that you don't understand what it's doing. Mm. Like some, some of the likes of the ones that Meta have come up with 
recently. I think that's a bit that's a bit more troubling sometimes. Mm. Um, but like you say, um, equally, the best way to understand some of these things sometimes is to just get them out there and see what happens with them. Yeah, I guess arguably we've all been part of an experiment, which is social media and black oh, that's box, going well, isn't it? Black box algorithms <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. try and create little. But yeah, echo chambers of interests that yeah, that's obviously caused political turmoil, right wing <laughs> resurgence, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it can be really bad. I don't think LLMs are that yet. No way. I, I to, to be absolutely clear, I don't think I don't think it's a, a bad a force for bad at all. I think it's a really a really good and exciting mm. set of innovations that are all happening in real time in front of our eyes. Um, but you know, there is the. They need to be responsible. Yeah, so it's interesting because you've got sort of innovating in the open. So companies that are happy just to throw stuff out there, see what the response of you know, gather the data, see what the response to it is, see how the public use it. Um, and then you've got companies like Apple that prefer to do a lot of this stuff in private until it's more polished and then unleash it. Um, mm. I guess pros and cons to, to bro- both approaches. Um, you know. It's interesting because OpenAI don't seem to be losing, you know, the sort of um, trust of, of people, I feel. I feel like the, the sort of innovation in the open seems to be working for them. Yeah. They're not, they're not, doing, they're not doing bad things. Mm. I think the, the only thing that they need, probably need to clean their act up on is like the provenance of where the data comes from. Yeah. And, and how they've come to acquire it. I think that's going to be the biggest sort of legal issue over the next few years in terms of you know you you see lots of um you see lots of clips re- where um they've been interviewed like senior people at open ai have been interviewed about data and they go oh, yeah. where did you get that data from that's allowed you to do that and they go well uh, well we've got many the things where the data could possibly have come from i don't know about them personally. and then they go is it from youtube and they go <laughs> is that the that was the mira Murati uh terrible interview yeah uh, with the cto of open ai where it just went really badly didn't like, get proper yeah. press training beforehand yeah but i don't think it seemed about press training she she, she colluded the answers you've like. to, if you're effectively a data company you need to know where that data they know from. where it's yeah. come from and it's not good answer yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, she she did the politicians answer, which is <laughs> <laughs> it's they've scraped the whole internet and yeah. fed yeah, it yeah. into a model. Yeah. yeah, but you need to, but you need a standpoint on that that you can confidently deliver if you if that's how you've built yeah. your company. But you wrote, you own it as part of your strategy. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. so you, you go you go yeah we've we've used everything that's publicly available on the internet. Yeah, that's how it works. Copyright it's, material, everything. abuse material, it loves, everything. It loves munching data. So we gave it or anything we could get our hands on. Yeah. yeah. And then we ran out of that. So we synthetically made a load as well. Mm. And yeah. So when do you both start as the marketing? <laughs> <intent>? <laughs> I just think, yeah, I like, I mean, you've you got to, you got to, you, ha- you have to have an answer for that because if they don't have an answer for it now, someone's going to come after an answer and, and be a lot more forceful about it. Yeah. In, you know, the in pro- a law sense. The problem is there's an uncomfortable truth hidden in all that, which is that copyright only protects mm. a large number of words in a particular order. It doesn't protect the idea or the thought or mm. the art or the concept. It doesn't, all your copyrighted stuff and the art that you think you own, it's not really yours. It's just that, it's yours in that particular form. Yeah. And sorry, it's, yeah. anyone can look at that and make their own interpretation of it. And that's where the law has to catch up. Yeah. So, like, that that's a that is an example of the the innovation is so advanced that it's caught the law side of it with its pants down. Mm. You you see those gaps as well in like in social media, for example. You see people posting uh, Facebook and Instagram posts where people are proclaiming like my content is my content. I own it all. Like you've seen those those yeah, posts, yeah. right? And that show- pass this on to five people, or you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you'll die. Yeah. Just give us your mother's maiden name. And we'll get on with it our day. Um, but you know that, that shows that the, there's a huge gap gap in gap a huge gap huge gap a huge gap in in the in that and uh, and people are scrambling to try and just say, well, it's all mine. Leave me alone. And that's not how it works. It's not- no, they've just indexed the fact that you put a stupid post on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's something worth stealing. There, clearly, yeah, yeah, and. 
yeah, even things like robots or TXTs, just a gentleman's agreement that you're yeah. not going to cross. It's not legally binding in any way, no. and anyone can override it. So the law does need to catch up, but it hasn't, and it's too late. You've kind of got these these two different ecosystems clashing there. You've got, you've got the internet, which was a very open kind of ecosystem of, of documents that were tied together. Yeah. And then you've got companies that want to try and protect that, but also use that for, for training as well now. Yeah. Basically. Well, Google set precedent early on by crawling the whole thing and making it searchable. Yeah. And then there was all the hoo-ha around when they started bringing little snippets in, because it used to be the meta description that used to show. Yeah. And then they brought in text from the actual page and mm. publishers kicked off. Mm. And now they're bringing in actual answers. And now with AI, they're bringing in everything. So, yeah. That hover on Arc, yeah. when you're searching, is so good. Have you had a play with it? I haven't seen the hover. So... On the Arc browser, if you Google something and you hover over a link, it jumps in with its own um, LLM and chucks you out a very brief description of the website before you click on it. That's nice. I like there that. There you go. This isn't very good for the listener. Yeah. So. And you've turned it off. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I remember turning it off, but yeah. I, Have you not turned it on? I don't know. I don't know. But I love Arc, and Arc is great. Um, it's a nice feature. Yeah, that's cool. I'll get my laptop out later. Yeah. Get Arc. It's really good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, obviously we've gone, down a, we've gone down a little bit of a cul-de-sac of a particular type of innovation there, but mm. like, obviously people are innovating all over the place in loads of stuff that isn't that you know i think um it depends when you're talking about imperfect innovation i suppose it depends where it's come from Mm. like if you're trying to sell things to people you're probably looking for gaps where people haven't thought to innovate before Mm. and that's inherently more risky than uh innovating to resolve a problem that exists yeah for example you know it's like uh this this has never worked and it needs to work better. So you innovate and you come up with a new way of doing it or a better way of doing it that resolves the problem. Mm. And you go, oh, life's, life's a lot easier now. We've done all that innovating. Yeah, it's But just... then if there's a complete gap somewhere and you go, no one's ever done that before, mm. let's go over there. I think it, that, co- that creates a lot more nervousness and a yeah. lot more risk. Mm. it's interesting because if you go back to that sort of google um bringing in text into the search results and all that sort of stuff you've got a situation where actually what google's trying to do now is give you the answer to what you were the answer to the question you're asking and that might mean just regurgitating some of that content in google without good citation has it solved the user's problem yes because it's got the answer that you were looking for has it done it in a way that is either you know uses dark patterns or has not fully sort of respected the source of that information probably that as well but yeah i mean it's going to get even worse with um microsoft having a co-pilot button on mm-hmm. on every laptop on every computer because yeah. that you're going to ask it a question and it's going to do exactly that but with bing yeah. bing sucks but the ai bit will be gpt4 so that'll be good and yeah. then it'll answer and no one will use search anymore yeah. everything will just be questions um i have started using chat gpt for quick queries yeah a lot more than i would use google it's so much quicker and so much quicker i mean you wouldn't use it for anything where you kind of like really reliant on something to be factually correct Mm. but it's like i can't even think of a good example but some things where you know that it's it's highly unlikely that it's just going to make something up i mean you everyone's moving through life with just good enough information and it's fine and like the recipe for a cocktail doesn't have to be Mm. cock on you yeah. just kind of know in your head what it is yeah. you could google something click the first link read through five stories 20 adverts and yeah. then the recipe or you could just ask chat gpt i have a i have a perfect example of this from last week um i was barbecuing which is a very enjoyable pastime that we all enjoy mm. um i was taking a, a foray into the world of brining which i know you're very love a brine very au fait with yeah um but I was worried that I was either going to um, make everyone have a heart attack or give them botulism <laughs> um, and Googled stuff. And obviously, exactly what you said, there's a load of um, paid blogs that are trying to sell you stuff. And then they say, for God's sake, don't do this because you'll, <laughs> you'll, your head will come off. Yeah. Um, 
you know, 20 results, all completely useless. I found a, a barbecue GPT that someone's built, um, a Texas barbecue GPT. I was like, I'm doing this cut. I'm doing like a 7% brine. Will that be all right? And it went, yep, that's that's strong enough for it to do what you need it to do, but it's not going to overdo it. Um, do you want some tips on how to improve it or like how you cook it from there? He's like, this is nice. a world away from bog standard or substandard Google results. Yeah. It's just, what Ask Jeeves wanted to be. Yes. Yeah. 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 Where's, oh, poor Jeeves. Where is it? <laughs> where is it? I do welcome that though because I hate those recipe websites where you have to jump through the entire life story of someone to get to the recipe. You know, someone talks about when they were 12, they started brining and it really opened their eyes <laughs> to the world and yeah. before you know it, yeah, you just want to find out about the brine. Yeah. And then loads of pop-ups start trying to sell you yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. I actually I really enjoy the the complete unusable nature of those sites. Like it's mm. so overwhelming. It's yeah, I enjoy it a lot. It's because they've figured out how to hack Google's algorithm to make it rank. Yeah, and you have to put a big ass story in, don't you? Yeah, there's a lot of that in uh, Instagram now. I don't know if you notice with like Instagram Explore, yeah. the descriptions on the posts are like chat gpt responses have you seen that no. so like it might be like so obviously like there's loads of cooking content on my explore and under like a, a video of some cooking happening there's like okay no problem let me tell you about the mercedes gc and it's like so, uh, yeah i have seen this yeah it's a really bizarre sort of trend that's happening very weird and i don't know how they're not on top of it because it's such a formulaic pattern to what's happening there but anyway um but yeah so so we, we've talked a lot about sort of um I guess good technical innovation, but one of the ones that stands out in history is uh, is Kodak and Kodak with digital pictures, digital imagery. So they had a hugely profitable um, kind of market for physical film and they had a bit of a problem where they sort of cannibalized themselves but couldn't really control that innovation within the company. Uh, and as a result of that, they sort of lost, lost the market share. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it, like... That's not imperfect innovation, but it's it's sort of like uh, I, I don't know how, what you'd call it, like pride in not willing to evolve from your cash cow, or like not willing to embrace that sort of future medium. I don't know. But. I, there's a lot of different things to unpack in it, isn't there? Because what they it's 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 really nice and easy to be Captain Hindsight in these things, course, isn't it? Yeah. But it, like one thing that they probably missed is like the sort of um, the premiumization of film mm, yeah. like you know i think you see we are going to keep steering back to ai <laughs> this is what's going to keep happening isn't it but there's a there's a thing take, take a step take a drink there's a thing <laughs> there's a thing that's happening at the minute where um obviously a lot of ai things are uh being seen it's certainly in creative stuff it's uh it's a it's a a vehicle to be able to mass produce stuff very quickly mm. and the value of that stuff uh, in as a result is lower mm. so you know you can make make 100 assets in a very very short space of time and charge less for it and do lots of them um which means that you get in this whole movement of um things that have been crafted by humans are more premium yeah and there's the there's the thought and the craft and the and the uh, and the the creativity that comes with having a talented group of people working on it. I think similarly in the Kodak story, um, as the digital side of things was becoming more and more prevalent, hmm. what what you could have said if you were the marketeers of the time is, but film is tangible. Film is yeah. your memories in a physical thing. So you've got that sort of loop back round to like Polaroids and stuff, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. And like the vinyl movement and, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. It's, uh, it's we we make the thing that makes your memory something that you can hold. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's like, this isn't a replacement for it. It's a, it's a different thing, right? It's a different, it's a different way to do it. Yeah. And I think, so there's, there's that whole angle of it. I think the other thing is, um, they innovated successfully mm. with the digital photography stuff, but then were so petrified of what they'd created that they didn't know, like, what, what do we do with it? Mm. Like, they didn't want to cannibalize this sort of main income, did they? Exactly. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, if they if they maybe had embraced it more, there's 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 room in the world for both. You yeah, know, yeah. people still shoot on, shoot on film now, don't they? It's, it, and like, like I said before, it's it has that more of a 
a, a, a feel to it. There's, a, mm. there's an inherent feel with a, with something that's shot on film. Um, that to me sort of reeks a little bit about like leadership not really being willing to go. The, the runaway train's happening here. Like digital is come, like it's gonna you know take over and, and also not accepting that though. Uh, it, it as you said, Captain in hindsight, it's, it, when you say that, that seems very obvious. Like you should have just obviously gone down both avenues and. Yeah, it's kind of interesting whether it was just more of a like a, a kind of, sort of business failure on that one. I like, think they knew they had a Kodak killer on their hands. Do you think? Um, just as Apple knew that mm. the iPhone was an iPod killer, yeah. but they were brave enough to push the button on it. Yeah. So it's yeah, I think a lot of companies do know their demise, mm. and they do like Blockbuster even had thoughts of doing a digital side, didn't they? I think they actually built one. Yeah, um, and Netflix came to them and pitched them it as well, and they were like, no. Don't they laughed them out of the building, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, no, we, no. We're, not, we're not doing that. <laughs> but it's just, it's staring them right in the face, but they're too scared to, like... It's actually, fear, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you find that a lot in a lot of businesses. They're protecting their sort of core market. They're protecting their cash cow. They, they, they don't want to disrupt that, but also want to show that they're not just going to sit on that and, and, and not kind of innovate. But yeah. you, you can't really do that without the sort of, uh, I guess, courage to maybe kill some of your projects as you evolve. I mean, Google will have this with AdWords. Yeah. They, yeah. they have to kill AdWords yeah. to, for Google AI to succeed. Mm. And I don't know if they've got the guts to do it. They need to build a better AI as well. First. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gemini is shit. <laughs> <laughs> it really struggles, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, another good example of this is that Nokia iPhone um, kind of situation happening around 2007. Um, Nokia had a huge, like, share of the of the mobile market, um, really started to, like, they started to really innovate very well with the whole smartphone thing, um, but their software was shite, and yeah. they hadn't really figured out, all they'd done is they'd translated the hardware, like, phone into the same thing as software they hadn't really thought about how it could be different and obviously at the same time the iphone was coming out and completely reimagined you know hardware buttons and everything and but that was an interesting one because nokia had such a stronghold um i just think that they um i just think that they it was completely beyond comprehension at the time that a phone would carry that kind of value mm-hmm like what it, it, it was uh, the CEO said no one is going to pay a thousand pounds for a phone <laughs> yeah um, again it's very easy to laugh at that now isn't it because mm. um, they're even more than that now I mean I don't like paying a thousand pounds for a phone but, no <laughs> but but it is you know but that's that's just how it is yeah um, I, I think phones were a different thing and Nokia were the embodiment of what they used to be mm. so for someone to rock up and say that's not what they are anymore, they are now this this really quite powerful computer that lives in your pocket now, yeah. and yeah. there's a value that's associated to that. Nokia just went, well, no, that's not what we that's not what we believe. Yeah, it's interesting as well because we we talk often about that um, iPint app when the iPhone first came out. Yeah, and it simple thing just showcased you drinking a pint from your phone, showed off some of the things like the accelerometer and everything. We talked about this in the past too, but. It's interesting how like the um, like Nokia and everyone kind of snarled at that, being mm. like, "No, no, all people really want to do is like answer emails in their pocket." Um, BlackBerry are doing the same. Like, oh, how can we take these desktop tasks and make them happen in your hand? And Apple were kind of like, "Yeah, but there's also this whole other world here that like you're not tapping into." Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And I remember they got mocked quite heavily, like by a lot of these initial apps in the App Store, because they were so gimmicky. But they were, but like it, it's. Like you said, it, it's um, it was to experiment and play with the new features that you've never had yeah. on those devices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just think I think it is with with them. It was this is the way that the world works according to Nokia, mm. and they just couldn't compute that that was changing, mm. or they just didn't have the the speed or the capability to be able to pivot to it quick enough. Yeah. Um, do we need to acknowledge Windows Phone and that whole bit I think of Nokia's so. life? Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that didn't do them any good, did it? No, no. I, I think the software side was the downfall, really, for them, wasn't it? Like, they, they just didn't really have a solid software strategy about how they wanted to innovate with that. Like, 
it was almost too powerful for what they were trying to do with it. Like, how can the makers of Snake Two <laughs> have got it so wrong? Because <laughs> I mean, man, yeah. How many? This I can't even. How many hours do you think you spent playing Snake Two? Oh God, quite a few. So, so many, so many hours. Oh, thousands of hours. Mm. To be fair, that is what you know. One thing that did beat the iPhone, you know, Snake Snake Two on on the Nokia. Was. They've had to put Snake back on the new modern Nokias now they've started making them again. <laughs> it's on there. I love that nostalgia hit. It's what we used to do before podcasts, isn't it? Snake. Mm. <laughs> and a big clunky CD player. <laughs> <laughs> um, so should we talk about Thranos a little bit? Because I know we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty nuts, the whole story. And if you haven't read Bad Blood, it's a good book. And yeah. They try to like, apply that Silicon Valley fake it till you make it mm. sort of ethos to medicine, which you shouldn't do <laughs> <laughs> because people actually relying on reliable results in order to make important health decisions. You can't move fast and break things when those things are people. It's That's not okay. N- no, it's it's a bit more important, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but they they were uniquely corrupt in that they set up lots of individual divisions, mm. and each division thought the other division had the working method of of this actually this these tests actually working so oh dear yeah so yeah. that went badly um and yeah she yeah she went to court she's it, going to prison it was big time fraud wasn't it big time fraud do you think um, the point where they realized it was fraud they tried to fix it i don't think that was that wasn't really no, publicized much was it she seemed like adamant that this small sample blood test was going to work mm. and it the science said otherwise mm. and you can't really go against science um so do you think there'll be a company that pick like cause on the face of it you know the idea is very good and and like if you think about um how those sort of tests are administered and everything like they're quite inaccessible that that you know I, I do think there is innovation to be had there it's just that you actually have to deliver on it <laughs> i yeah. guess is the start of that yeah and no because they were they were hyping themselves up so much. They managed to bag that Walgreens deal, didn't they? So they had a load of space inside. It's basically equivalent to our boots, but way m- more massive in America. Mm. And they were starting to roll them out, but then taking double samples. So taking the little sample and a bigger sample and running it through like Siemens equipment or like uh. other competitors equipment. And it was just nuts. Mm. It's like, it's not really innovation. It's like, it's just corruption. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the problem with that, though, is that it it, sound, it sort of um, constrains future innovation because now people are going to be super wary of that that sort of tech. Oh yeah, it turns the whole um, all the VCs off that particular se- segment for ages, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, look, look at look at all the um, technologies that constitute what you would have previously called the metaverse. Now, mm. like people won't touch them with a shitty stick now mm. and that's a real shame because there's lots and lots of components of that whole movement which are very very good innovations very powerful very useful um but mm. because they were associated with that term and that time they just got completely binned off now yeah there are companies that seem to have been on the right side of history of this though is it zoe the um the the sort of all round a monitoring that you can yeah. Yeah. You eat that blue biscuit and shit it out yeah is that Zoe or is that the other one um, <laughs> <laughs> you, saw, you saw my you saw my face drop <laughs> like, Josh is looking at me like what the fuck's we on about <laughs> so, so um, just tell me a bit more about that one <laughs> so you eat this thing and then it, it, it can it can reveal your gut micro Bio. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so that wasn't what I was thinking of, but maybe that's because Zoe do loads of like holistic. Got, Zoe, the, the the big thing that Zoe do now is the smart patch, isn't it? Yeah, right. The big okay. yellow patch. And I was about to say, along, alongside Zoe, there's a whole host of other um, companies that are doing those sort of diabetes glucose monitoring things. But I think Zoe has like a a holistic approach to it, where they can also do like nutritional advice, and I think they can do like meal planning. So it's quite a big thing, but um, it's expensive. It's expensive, and I'm not like I'm not sure if I completely agree with all, all of that. But what, I, what I'm saying is like it's got to the point of mass adoption, and it seems to like have won the sort of hearts and minds of legislators and, and things like that, where it's kind of working quite safely within that space. Yeah, yeah. I mean the company that is now Zoe 
um, they were the guys that did the the COVID study, the data study in the UK, the COVID tracker, weren't they? Mm. Um, and I think that earned them the sort of um, trust and um, like the credentials, like they're working with the government. They were tracking it better than the government could. Yeah. Oh, um, he's, he's found it. I found it. It, oh, is, it, is, Zoe. it is Zoe. I'm so sorry for mocking it's you. It's okay. <laughs> oh, you can you can join in the conversation too at hashtag blue poop challenge. <laughs> yeah, it was a thing. But it's it's about, I think part of it was the amount of time it takes for the blue to get from your mouth to your bum. Right. Basically. So um, I'm just going to need a little bit more information if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. You're listening to the tech podcast <laughs> off script. <laughs> hashtag blue poop challenge. <laughs> so you... you was it a device you ate, or was it literally just a It's blue, a biscuit. A biscuit. Yeah. I think it's just rammed full of blue food colouring. Yeah, and then is. when it came out the other end, you're like, you've completed it? Or how's that You work? get your gut transit time. Dr. Tim comes and shakes your hand after you've washed it. Who, <laughs> <laughs> who was that um, horrendous um, lady who did... Um, oh, no. Um, uh, Jill- yeah, I know. Gillian McKeith. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there she is. Yeah, I think I'm sure she'll be popping up as an MP of the Reform Party anytime soon. But, um, yeah, she was she was awful. Um, okay, so so this wasn't this wasn't nothing. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, Leo. it's right, okay. It back. Don't worry. I don't think they do it anymore. But, no. Um, yeah, that was the thing, and it is a bit of a fad to figure out how long it takes to travel. But yeah, I would be quite interested to know that. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But I think um, I think there is a load of innovation around health, especially like Apple are doing it on the watch. But you can actually see the contents of. It's way beyond me. We can see like the oxygen levels in blood and things mm. like that, and also murmurs, heart murmurs. Infrared light, isn't um, it? Is it? Nice. So if you shine an infrared beam through your skin, um, oxygenated blood is, I can't remember which it is, more or less reflective than deoxygenated blood. Nice. That's, not a, that's probably not the right word. I yeah. read this once. I like um, that. <laughs> so yeah, basically it, when you shine the light through it, it can see pulse and all sorts, blood oxygen. Nice. But you've you got to imagine when we've got all these sophisticated devices that are like looking at pupils and things like that. Because like, mm. pupil dilation is quite a common thing to look out, that doctors look out for. Mm. And actually the most important thing with health is that you catch symptoms early. So I think all these devices are going to start warning us like... Not necessarily diagnosing, because that mm. would be too much, but like maybe you should go get checked out. Or well, like, other things are going to start diagnosing, like not obviously not on your, your own personal yeah. device, but, mm. you know, sequencing um, DNA and sequencing like bacteria and other scientific things. Yeah. That, that's that's a, a much more uh, viable possible solution today than it was even a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, because Apple have not so quietly been building this, you know, health app that plugs into everything. Um, and I'm really interested to see where it goes with like the Vision um, Pro, for example, because there's, you know, all the studies around dementia and eyesight and how like all these things are connected basically. So yeah. any sort of devices that we have that plug into, you know, how, how you're seeing things, how, how you're hearing things. Um, obviously, Watch has been doing some of this with Apple Health and everything, but like imagine you know a point in the future where they can detect early stage dementia and things like that like yeah. i think it'll be amazing um, yeah, definitely or like fatigue when you're driving or yeah. yeah well yeah my car does that quite a lot at the moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> just constantly in warning mode <laughs> do not drive what, what's quite interesting with a lot of the um language model stuff is certainly some of the um degenerative um sort of brain issues that people get reveal themselves through speech mm. so if you've got devices that know what you sound like all the time mm. and then you start to not sound the same anymore like early warning signs for you know um yeah like dementia parkinson's things like that that's that's amazing mm. yeah. that's really cool and it you know like um google google are very clever at sort of like basically um like zero waste innovation aren't they yeah like so They'll they'll build a thing, and a weird sort of like offshoot of that is another thing that they built, and actually it's feeding something else that's feeding something else. Like, um, ah, oh, uh, captures mm. where you're actually training Google Maps on on things that it's seen oh, on yeah. Street View. Yeah, mm. road signs. Like, yeah. they're they're two completely separate worlds of things that you that you're doing. 
but one is actually feeding the other. And I just think that's mm. so clever. And if we're looking at some of this stuff to do with, um, you know, voice recognition, um, like NLP stuff, mm. imagine if it could know purely from listening to your voice every day, if there was something starting to go on and it, it was able to recognize that on device. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, have I just come up with that? Have I just invented? Have I just? <laughs> You've changed the world. Have I just changed the world? I think you have. Yeah, I think it Ace. Can detect when you're pissed as well, and to tell you to not send that message. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we saved the world. <laughs> <laughs> Say this limerick three times before sending. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever tried to get an e-scooter um, late at night? No, I haven't. It makes you do like a little aptitude test oh does it oh, right. yeah so you so you boot your phone on it and it's like a little app clip comes up and it's like okay it's quite late now let's let's make sure you're not hammered when the stop sign appears you tap your screen oh, that's a good idea you're going along oh, a little road going along a, li- a little cartoon road and the stop sign appears and you hit it and it's like yep you reacted in good enough time unlock your scooter that's or, or it says you're hammered get in a taxi that's because fuckloads of people have ended up in a and e isn't it yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was I was in like Paris and Berlin. Like they don't, I don't think they do that there because <laughs> the streets are chaos. <laughs> maybe, maybe in the UK, quick way to break your wrist. <laughs> this was a uh, this was specifically with Lime, yeah, um, as a provider, and I was I was working, so nice. I'm happy to say that I was not hammered. Um, but yeah, nice little feature that that is nice. Yeah, um, I thought it'd be good to talk about uh, innovation that's completely not required. <laughs> Uh, um, you're a big fan of Coca-Cola, Jack. Yep. Um, they tried to to change the recipe. Nope. Don't do that. Yep. And it hit. It fell on its ass, didn't it? Yep. But they reckon that some of the blind taste tests, the new Coke was better. Mm. But I don't think they did enough testing. They just got they got really rattled by Pepsi, and they just didn't like mm. didn't like that they were sort of stepping on their turf too much and they thought well the answer is to make it more like pepsi mm. and actually what what you very quickly realize is the reason that there is it there is a divide there is because people don't like the taste of pepsi yeah mm. oh there's nothing worse when you say can i have a coke please and they go we've got pepsi is that okay it's well, not okay not okay no. is monopoly money okay <laughs> <laughs> that's I, that's very good thank you yeah that's what i that's what i say mm. yeah yeah i mean there's no need to invoke there right no, and it's no, it, just, it's have psycholog- confidence in your product. At psychological that point. as well. It's like it. They love that product. They love that you love it, and it's all the brand stuff. Like Red Bull in blind taste tests tastes like shit, but yeah. the branding and everything's so strong. Like yeah. if you'd have put that in front of any any marketeer, they were like, well, "We can't sell this. This is awful. <laughs> it smells like bull piss." Um, that's, that's, that is what it is. <laughs> yeah. That's monster. Yeah, no, that's monster. Oh my god. But then people like the fact that it's sort of a bit weird, or it's, it's, it owns its own thing. <laughs> bit tart, a bit tart. Like, yeah. <laughs> but you can't fuck with Coca Cola, can you? No. no. I mean, I th- the number one thing to say on the whole Coca Cola thing is: look how many times Pepsi have felt like they needed to change their branding. Mm. I'll tell you, it's many. Uh, how many times have Coca Cola changed their logo? Mm. Zilch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it's a good like you've got to ask the sort of what if question there though. So if, if Coke had gone, we're going to plow ahead with this anyway. Do you think that would have meant that they would have possibly died? Like do you they think- they got quite close. Mm. It it was nearly very bad for them. I think. Did they replace the recipe completely? When they, yeah, yeah, when they branded it as New Coke. Ah right. And um, the the version you know the version of the logo that's the just the word Coke. Yeah. Mm. They, that was from the, the new Coke branding. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I see. But yeah, people, people just didn't like it. Yeah, interesting. Don't mess with something that's perfect. What are you doing? Mm. <laughs> and then there's a whole zero sugar saga. But I don't know how much I can say about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did actually sign an NDA for the zero sugar Pepsi stuff. But yeah, it's fine. Okay, I'm really intrigued now. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's going to have to stay there. <laughs> Yeah, the long and short of it is different markets adapt very different rates and they need different coercions. And I still won't buy zero sugar, even the, yeah, even when it tastes basically the same. It's not the same, is it? No. How does it taste the same? It doesn't. It can't. What? Like, okay. Like Mountain Dew, for example. 
how does the sugar-free one taste like oh, that? That tastes so sweet. How do they? How do they do that? I mean, it was fucking radioactive to begin with. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing should be that color. Yeah, no. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the examples that we, we kind of got. I mean, we, we co- covered the segue a little bit, but you know, we didn't. We didn't cover it on record, did we? No, we didn't. Um, see, it's a shame that the founder of this um, sadly passed away through his own creation. Um, but I really like the Segway. I thought it was pretty. I mean, I buy daft one-wheeled skateboards, so um, and you definitely shouldn't go on that. By the way, <laughs> after your collarbone incident. a one-wheel skateboard that yeah. sounds great. It is. Well, I don't know how much you should go on it, really. I was on it today. <laughs> so, I, yeah, it is terrifying though. <laughs> it's. Do people point at you as you go past? Look, there's yeah. a man, a there's giant a, man on a his, wheel. His face is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> he looks very ginger, and he's on a one-wheeled skateboard. Mm. Um, my my midlife crisis has hit early, and uh, yeah, it's segways are remarkably easy to not fall off. To be honest, I I think they're still like they're quite terrifying though when they sometimes yeah get, you know you have to you have to kind of learn to trust it mm. and you have to hope that it doesn't crash because when when the safety thing kicks in it turns off its self writing thing and then mm. it, then you are just stood on a <laughs> stood on a platform between two wheels with no way of holding yourself up but it is like in, innovation wise like as a personal transporter it is unbelievable but the problem is that the implementation of it was like very unnatural for a lot of people like mm. oh simply just lean forward as if you're going to hit the ground okay That's you won't cool. hit the ground yeah oh, oh by the way the founder did die though hitting the ground so well yeah, but he went off a cliff edge didn't he he went off a cliff and i believe this might be a myth but I believe he was getting out of the way of someone coming the other way and then lost control rather than it being like... What, like a seagull? No, I think it was a dog walker. Oh, right. But like at, in the in the product's defense, I don't think it was the product that went wrong. I think he was trying to move it out the way and lost control of it, basically. Mm. But this is the thing. So like, I, I think we'll, you know, look at Back to the Future again, like, you know, hoverboards and everything still a very specific demographic of people who want to use them because not everyone likes skateboarding as a sensation. It's not very safe. Mm. I won't say it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, you, you don't need to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like people people want more protection and security from a traveling device. The thing is, though, like the car was that to some people when it first got invented. Yeah. Like the the whole notion of a car. Can you imagine coming up with the concept of a car now if it had never been <laughs> yeah yeah you're like right okay what we're gonna do we're gonna put these uh give everyone one of these things it'll go really fast if you want it to you're in control yeah um we'll make these tracks all over the world that anyone can drive their really fast box on and we'll put really, really mega flammable liquid in it, and that's what makes it go along. But it's extremely rare and made from ancient fossils. Yeah. It's, <laughs> what we've done is we've ground up loads of prawns over millions of years, <laughs> and then we kind of like distill that and then put that in the fast moving box things, and everyone can have a go on it. But you'd be like, you are bonkers. What are you talking about? Yeah, so then you, it's no uh, mean feat to go, well, we're going to go from that then also to a flying car, like the Le Mans flying car in 1953, where it's like, we still don't trust the car as a thing, and now you're trying to make it fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that the, the flying car thing is just fraught with problems, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think the test flight for that crashed quite badly, so um, it did quite work out. Um, can we just go back to technology slightly a little bit with Napster? Because I think that's something worth a call out. Yeah. It was, in in a lot of ways, really good, near perfect innovation in terms of like accessing and sharing music um, way ahead of its time, really. Um, but it just didn't win the hearts and minds of lots of companies that were making money out of the music industry at the time. Yeah, well, there was no good legal way to get tunes onto your computer no you could rip a cd um which took ages because you had one or two speed Mm. cd drives Um, that wasn't really ever like kind of approved by the record industry though it was just no they didn't like ripping either did they so it was like but that that happened at least in isolation right rip it onto your local device at least you can't share it with other people yeah until until napster Mm. um 
Yeah, it was really cool, wasn't it? When you first discovered it, and you're like, "Oh fuck, I can get, mm. I can get this new Lincoln Park single um, yeah. in in <laughs> only forty five minutes," <laughs> 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 and, and just hope that one user that's sharing it with you doesn't disconnect because it was just it was a one hit <laughs> thing, wasn't it? The yeah. thing about music piracy was it was easier than going to a record store and buying a piece of music. Yeah. But it wasn't really replacing that. It was, it, or maybe it did eventually, but at the time, because it was quite, still took quite a long time, you always had people taping stuff off the radio and things like that. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. That, I love that game, like trying to get it just before the, like yeah, Pete yeah. Tong speaks yeah, yeah, at the yeah. end of the song. Yeah. Press the button. Yeah. But the, 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 thing that, the thing that ultimately killed music piracy was when there was something that was easier than that. Yeah. I.e. iTunes. Yeah. And then, and then Spotify. But you know, like that, it's that's innovation through ultimately laziness. Mm. Yeah, people people just want to do the easiest thing. Yeah, and yeah, for iTunes to bag those deals, they had to put heavy, heavy DRM in, didn't they, to yeah. begin with? Which is now all come off again because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. it's just yeah, it's just stupid layers of obf- obfuscation that anyone can get around. So yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, it took a lot for iTunes, I think. And I think without Apple, I don't. I think it would have taken a lot, lot longer. Mm, yeah. I've just got this really amazing image of you just sitting, sitting patiently for 45 minutes for, for LinkedIn to be <laughs> downloaded. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Oh. LinkedIn Park. I, d- I do not want to hear any piece of music that LinkedIn has created. <laughs> oh, that was a slip, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Here's what my single has taught me about B2B business sales. <laughs> So that, that's the imperfect innovation in this context is those fucking chat GPT posts with the rocket emoji everywhere. <laughs> and I can't stand it. Um, yeah, not not good for me. Um, Little tip. Add to your custom instructions on chat GPT that you don't want it to include emojis. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thanks. So are you still using that for generating posts? Then? <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> the less time I spend on LinkedIn, the better, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. That's a different episode. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, cool. Well, yeah, thanks Thanks for this chat. I, I think, you know, I, I've really enjoyed sort of digging into some of the, the history lessons of, of uh, imperfect innovation. Um, yeah, I think for me, you know, there's, there's sort of a lot, a, lot of learn, like a lot to learn from the way OpenAI actually tackling things. I know we talk about it a lot, but I really like how they're doing it in the open. I really like how they're failing in the open. They're not getting it all right. Um, I really like the fact that um, they don't seem to really care either. Um, mm. But, it's uh, it's only a matter of time until probably there's some something serious happens. I feel, but yeah, but yeah, I guess we'll see what happens there. Fingers crossed, it'll all be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. we, let's have a have a pint and hope it all blows over. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Thanks again for listening to Offscript. Hit subscribe for more episodes in the future and we'll see you next time.